Go ahead, please. Okay, share screen. Yeah, you just do that green button. Okay, cool. Well, it was really kind of exciting that you guys are, have a systems and cybernetics background because that's basically where I started out. Um, I started out as an engineer doing high tech R and D back in the seventies and early eighties, and then I, you know, I went off into social sciences and particularly into psychology for a while, but became horrified at the state of science in psychology. So oh, I yeah. went off <laughs> yeah, searching for uh, something yeah. better, and then I, I stumbled I just across tested negative. Good, excellent. So, no, hey, I Bob, could you, Bob, could you Bob, could you mute your your another. Bob, could you mute yourself? Yeah, there you go. Um, anyway, um, I discovered system science, and it was at the same time that uh, chaos theory, nonlinear dynamics, was just coming into being. So I actually ended up having this dream team dissertation committee, which had people who were nonlinear dynamics and non equilibrium thermodynamics. And the combination really showed me that there, there's a sort of like a physical basis for. Um, systems theory and and that it, you can therefore you can use those to create a sort of type of science that that's more effective and more apropos for living in and human systems in particular so I've been pursuing that ever since but what I you know for me it's really important to start out with these sort of identifying what's going on today and what's the key problem between behind all of our types of all of the different crises, the social, intellectual, um, political, economic, and environmental crises are all stimulated, are all caused by the same core type of dysfunctional root belief system, which I'm calling oligarchic capitalism, which is an, a variation on the original oligarchy, which Aristotle called government for, by the rich and for their own advantage. We just now have an economic version of that. Um, anyway, but if you put all the pieces of what I call, now I call energy systems theory, which is basically the energy forces and flow basis of systems theory, you get this different view of humanity and civilization. So in, in this view, humanity is a collaborative learning species that thrives on regenerative circulation, which means investing in the human and capacities and infrastructure that do all the work. Fractal structures, which is what I see Bob's Bob Alonowitz's work as in Window of Vitality, is a variation on um, a fractal hierarchy. Common cause culture and collective learning aimed at the health of the whole. And so, what I'm going to do here is just sort of give you a brief overview of the kind of science, which this should all be pretty familiar to you guys. Um, that goes into making this more than just a loose metaphor, but really something more of a actual ability to have science in, in the social system kind of realm. Whoops. Okay. So, whoops, there we go. So I see um, what's happening today as part of this larger science. Science is basically a shift from this materialist reductionist machine view of the world to a living learning energy system view. And when I see this energy system science is a more effective empirical framework for living and super living systems like economies. So I'm using energy systems science as this umbrella term for all sorts of disciplines that study energy and forces and flows role in health development, emergence and evolution. And obviously systems theory, the original one was all about universal patterns. Um, and basically, I see energy systems as providing the base explanation for why those exist, the morphodynamics. Nonlinear dynamics is really, really morphodynamics or geometries of behavior is what I was taught. Non-equilibrium th thermodynamics is the broader story of how energy processes and pressors give rise to organized, uh, organized systems anyways. But there's a whole bunch of different um, disciplines that are using variations on that. So the first thing to, to remember is that energy is self-organization theory. So energy not only creates organization, it creates a particular type of organizations, which are flow networks of frequently horribly named dissipative structures. 
Um, but anyway, there are systems whose existence and functioning depend on circulation of resources throughout the entirety of their being. In this view, this kind of gives an explanation for something that's been around for a long time, which is this idea that economy is really a society's metabolic system, a network of interdependent specialists whose collective activities produce all the energy, information, goods, and services that society needs to, to survive. Okay, the other part of this is, is what I learned is more for dynamics, which is we live in an inseparably interwoven web of forces and flow, which produce these snowflake patterns. I mean, that's basically what system science started out observing. And this goes way back to sacred geometries and I see fractals. And chaos theory is nonlinear dynamics as basically being a new version of sacred geometries is there. And the little diagram on the right side, um, with the little drops that going down on a on a plate. This was a a uh, experiment by two French side scientists, Duade and Coudre, Coudre, I guess it is, where they were showing that if you magnetize these little droplets and put them on a on a little disc of fluid with magnets around the outside, they will jostle themselves back and forth in order to create the the golden spirals that you see in all sorts of sacred geometry things. So this is all by way of ex explaining that what we see in, in geometries of behaviors are really the, the back and forth uh, interactions of, of um, interacting dynamics, interwoven dynamics, forces and flows. So for me, the reason hi fractal hierarchies are so common is because they optimize cross-scale circulation function and strength. And they do this by maintaining a balance of small, medium, and large entities, which is why you have a power law. The healthy hierarchies uh, have a power, power law distribution. Anyway, and they, but it, what Bob's work does is it, it also explains why that same kind of balance is necessary to balance efficiency and resilience. In, in, in a fractal terms, you also it also balances flexibility and constraints and diversity and unity, or what I call community. Anyway, these things are actually pretty relevant to social systems because I mean, one of the things that it helps you do is it realizes that all levels and sizes play a role, um, but too much or too little of any one of them creates problems with for the health of the whole. So, in banking, for instance, each scale needs organizations that are just right to meet the needs of activities at that scale. But if we have a system that, a social system that emphasizes efficiency and large scale size growth at regardless of how, how big you become or how you become big, then what you get is too big to fail creates ex excessive concentration, which is creates a, an extractive wealth pump that drains lower levels, which eventually leads to economic necrosis, the hollowing out of economic networks caused by poor circulation to lower levels. Um, I'm actually trying to do a, a, an empirical study of this, um, using, I hate to say it, chat GPT and AI, because they give you huge amounts of access to, to data. Um, and you can basically go throughout, especially the shift from the New Deal progressive era where they were putting constraints on, on concentration in particular and, and increasing circulation, to, especially to the lower levels, that you, you can see why that led to a greater stability and, and vitality throughout the system. Whereas we've had last 50, 60 years of neoliberal economics, which basically unleashes the forces of con concentration and um, reduces circulation to the lower levels. And it has been le led to not only loss of social cohesion and trust, but essentially all of this hollowing out, uh, this economic necrosis, the hollowing out, dying off of large swaths of economic tissue. Anyway, but the other part of what I think energy systems is sciences are really important about is because they naturalize into information and intelligence so that it's not just um, living systems are these knee jerk genetically driven um, kinds of 
organizations. In fact, there's a, a bioenergetics guy at Harvard and Tufts who Michael Levin, who's been really looking at how intelligent behavior, the you know communication between uh, cells in a, in the body and lead to are important and even handle a great deal more than to do a great deal more to shape behavior than genes themselves. Anyway, so this, I, you guys must know Maturana and Varela. They were back in the eighties. Anyway, but I agree with them. To live is to cognize. The most important aspect of life is not genes. It's the ability to respond functionally to information. Anyway, the obvious Next point part is that life becomes more complex by collaborating. I mean, this has been around forever and ever. Again, this is Lynn Margulis's serial symbiosis. But <clears throat> if you look at, I mean, you see this in all kinds of things, but living systems in particular, they're, it's always smaller parts coming together in larger synergetic and common cause holes. Anyway. I also use the work of Eric Chasen, who's been looking at how he calls it cosmic evolution. I've always just used the more the simpler dynamic evolution, but basically the idea is that as as systems get bigger, the, the forces holding them together get stretched to a breaking point. You see this in embryos, and so they when they the only way to really get bigger is to keep small and connected in these growing lace-like networks of connective tissue, which is what you see when you look at the evolution of the nervous system and also in the evolution of, of human systems. You find in order to stay coordinated, if you're a co collaborative whole, you have to communicate. And when, because when you get out of touch, you basically lack coordination and you can't really function. What's interesting is that these connective structures and communication structures also help the evolution of circulation capacities at a human or pardon me organizational capacities and collective intelligence so that's what eric chasen's work in looking at flux densities has really helped that kind of stuff so all of this gives us a kind of a basic reason why humanity really is a collaborative learning species that's our main survival strategy is to Pull information, forge better hypotheses about how the world works, and then change our collective behavior by changing our collective beliefs. And so one of the things that I think needs to happen these days is, is a greater emphasis on coming together about how do we get a narrative that it actually advances those kinds of, that basic principle. Anyway, what makes a society healthy, if you put all of these pieces together, you have on the cultural side, what you need to do is emphasize, promote collective learning. It's not just learning, it's learning that, that advances the health of the whole in some way. And so we should be able to think, you know, have reliable information and um, effective processing. So you get to really find out whether or not this particular innovation is making things better or worse, as we now see with AI kind of the question going on there. Um, common cause values end up really being central to all of this kind of thing because they're essential to getting us to work together in, in, a, in a, a mutually effective way. I'm, I'm sort of sorry that um, Jerome is not with us today because his work I am is here. There. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you are. I'm You're here. there, Jerome. I was, just, I was just a few minutes late. Sorry. <laughs> Well, because I, I I didn't know you before, but I looked up your stuff and it's right down the, I mean, see, your work in collaborative systems is like right down the alley of what I believe is the central to getting our civil global civilization out of this, the hole that we're in now, it was how do you build common cause commitment and synergy among specialists? Because that's actually more important than the win-lose struggle for dominance, which is what we're engaged in nowadays. But to, in, in order to have a society that, learns well collectively and has common cause values, you also have to have regenerative circulation. You have to actually invest in human capacities and infrastructure. And you also have to have this fractal balance of sizes because that's what, if you don't have that, what you get is positive feedback systems that suck all the wealth from the lower levels and concentrate it at the top and creating kind of explosive conditions. 
Okay, so that's my 20 minute or 15 minute explanation of um, where these 10 measures came from. So if you, the most obvious things for me in regenerative circulation is first, you have to have cross scale circulation. Um, secondly, you have to have regenerative investment, which for me is investment in human capacities and infrastructure that, that moves the society forward and keeps them cohesive. Um, you have to have reliable in, and help reliable inputs and healthy outputs, which are the fundamentally what sustainability is all about. You have to have resilient structures. You have to have a balance, proper balance of sizes, balance of resilience and efficiency and sufficient number and diversity of roles. Most importantly, you have to have these common cause values, which I think we haven't really figured out how to measure this yet, except degree of mutualism turns out to be relevant in ecosystems as well as um, human systems or living systems anyway. But constructive and, and extractive is something that uh, processes, I guess, is the, is the right name there. Because right now we have a great deal, I mean, we emphasize extraction over constructive things. So, so if you look at charts of how much money now is being invested in actual productive activities, it's like my, minuscule compared to, you know, the stuff that goes into extraction and speculation and rent seeking and all these other kinds of things. And then, of course, collective learning. I, at least on collective learning, you have people like Joseph Stiglitz has a, has a series of books out of, on creating a learning society. So I think there's some hope for that. Anyway, so that's my 30 seconds summary of how you get from energy systems to a real understanding of why common cause values are essential. Collective learning is essential, as is regenerative circulation and resilient structures. Ta-da! <laughs> Questions for clarification? Are people uh, all shocked or people uh, confused? Or, <laughs> or everyone just agrees. Everyone agrees 100%. <laughs> everyone. Yeah, I think that it's like preaching to the choir here. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, may, may I tell you one question? Flux density, I have not completely understood that concept. Oh. Yeah, I have that question too. Please say more about that. Um, flux density is basically the circulation of energy per unit time per unit density or ergs per second minus, minus to, the one to, to the minus one and grams per minus one. Um, the catch with this version of energy systems is it's not just fuel or like electricity or gasoline that you're measuring. You could, energy is anything that, that creates motion, which includes money and resources. So what uh, Chasen does is he actually uses that multidisciplinary understanding of what energy flow is to look at how well, I mean, some of it is just sort of obvious. That is, if you, as you get bigger, you need more energy circulation in order to support the functioning of that, that additional structure. Then why, then why Milky Way is one and the Sun is two and the Earth's biosphere is 500? That is mysterious. Well, that's because, I mean, these are, it's the tightness of organization that needs additional circulation support. So, Milky Way is really huge, but it works very, it cycles very slowly and it, I don't know what else to say. Um, it, it almost seems like maybe he set that as a baseline. It, yeah, I, I think it makes more sense if you look at the, you know, you can compare modern civilization, agriculturists and hard gatherers and and those numbers. But yeah, that, that those bottom three also, it, it does, yeah, it's, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, Milky Way seems seems odd there. Yeah. yeah. Also, um, yeah, he talks about things like uh, the stars and so forth having, you know, a two or a three compared to humans with five hundred or something like that. And that kind of struck me as odd because stars are very hot. Okay, uh, but uh, if you actually go to the to the to the math to the to the measurements in mathematics, it does work out, and it's rather struggling. Interesting. Uh, now, why, like, why the sun is two? How does the two and the one related with each other? I mean, Milky Way from a Milky Way to Sun becomes one to two. 
it, you know, it's something like joules per unit uh, gram per per unit time. It's a it's a process. It's very important because uh, 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 Jason's theory is all about process, not about things. Physics is all about things, objects moving according to uh, in, to, to laws, to universal laws. Whereas uh, uh, if you look at processes, the so-called process ontology, uh, you can explain a lot of things that you miss, uh, especially about living systems with, uh, with pure physics. And you can actually go beyond physics and talk about ensembles and whatnot. But I don't, I don't anyway, I'll, I, I have, I'll talk about things later. Well, if we're done here, why don't you go ahead and do your thing? <laughs> Let me let me raise one other, one other point. Maybe this is even just more internal. So thanks. Yeah, that was a great introduction and overview. On the last slide with the, the picture of the 10 properties, um, I know we're probably not going to change this picture at this point because it's already out there like this. But I when I lecture on it, I I tend to want um, reliable inputs, healthy outputs to be the, the first principles, right? It's an open system. That you 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 first have That's to fine. stuff right you know and so I I'm mean, kind of regret that we didn't make reliable inputs as the number one. Um, Some of this for me is that um, I'm trying to speak to people who care about economics and and human systems in particular. Yeah. And so for me the cross scale circulation is you know it's kind of like Keynesian economics and same thing re regenerative e e investments is basically progressive economics. Right. So that but you have to have some inputs in order to circulate it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, so, yeah. I'm, I completely understand yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but anyways, other, 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 yeah, it almost goes back to a uh, daily and and I'm forgetting who else was published the like the basic rules of sustainability. You know, if you don't have enough input, you don't have healthy outputs, then you're you're, sure. you're not sustainable. Um, well, and and from any kind of living systems theory, that, that's obvious. If you don't have food or water or air. Yeah gonna die. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, good, thanks. <laughs>